Hello, everybody, and welcome to this latest in the Values Jam guest session series. And Priyanka, thanks so much for coming along. And to start with, please introduce yourself and tell everybody about the great work that you do. Thanks for having me, Alan. This is such an exciting conversation. I'm really quite looking forward to it because I'm not quite sure what's going to happen. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm Priyanka Dutt. I operate as uh, the chief advisor India for a global generosity movement called Giving Tuesday. Um, I made the shift to Giving Tuesday last year after having spent over 20 years working in media and communications, uh, the large part of which I worked in the social sector, so using media and communications to create social impact. And it was, um, I think I got to the point where I just needed to do something new, something different. And it really, uh, I've been saying this to anybody who will listen, which is that all my life I've made career decisions based on my skills and my experience and what I know how to do except this last move to Giving Tuesday, because this one has been a values-based move. So it feels particularly apt to be talking about Giving Tuesday um, in this Values Jam session. Giving Tuesday is an amazing, amazing movement. It started as a really simple idea, as a day to come together with community and do good, and do good in any way that really appeals to you. So give time, give talent, give treasure, which is both money and things, give testimony. Uh, and give it to whatever matters to you. So Giving Tuesday is not here to tell you how to give. It's just here to encourage you to give and to connect you with millions of other people in the world who are also giving. Um, and it's, it's an incredible movement because it's led by people from all over the world, from all walks of life, who discover the movement, are deeply connected to community, however they describe community, and they then want to bring generosity into their communities as a key lever to create change. Mm -hmm. And then that's when you see magic start to happen. Because yeah. they all create this movement in their own mold, in their own way, in ways that are most relevant to their communities and to their contexts. So you see the movement being named different things in different parts of the world. So in Brazil, it's, I'm going to pronounce this all wrong, I'm sure, but it's Dia de Duar. In Mexico, it's Undia Paradar. In Singapore, they celebrate it not as a, as a day, but as a whole week of giving. Uh, so different people take it on and do different things with it in ways that sort of really speak to them. But year on year on year, it's now 11 years old. We just see this movement growing rapidly. It's now in almost 100 countries. Um, and it's led by just normal everyday people who have a belief in the vision of this movement, which is to reimagine a world built on shared humanity and radical generosity. So I'm super, super excited to be growing this work in India. I'm not one of the movement leaders. I'm part of a nucleus organization that's helping to grow the movement and to sort of really think about what it takes to create more connection and more, you know, to solidify that network in more ways that means that this entire global network of Giving Tuesday leaders, participants, people who engage with it in some way or the other, they're all connected to each other and they're all learning from each other. And very much like a murmuration of starlings, it just sort of grows and changes and takes different shapes depending on who joins the movement and which direction they go in. Yeah, I, that's the, the stuff love, that I'm doing right now. <laughs> I, love, I love that metaphor of the murmuration of starlings because there are not that many organizations or movements even that have the confidence to give everybody who wants to be involved the freedom to be involved in any way they wish. You know, there's this temptation, I think, for in whatever we're involved in, that we want to kind of exert some sort of control and order. And so I love the fact that you allow people to just go and do what they want to do to create the most value. That's wonderful. Um, Okay, so let's um, let's choose our values jam card, Priyanka. So here's the deck. I'm going to tip the cards out. And uh, how many piles would you like me to make in front of me? Ooh, let's go with two. I feel like I need a sip of water. Just the two, okay. And so left or right, which are you going to go for? Left, please. <clears throat> so I'm. I don't know how many cards I've got here, but it's probably around about thirty. So a number between one and 30, please. Let's go with six. Six. 
Okay, we were talking before about what sort of card would we get, and uh, so what do you think about this one? Oh my goodness, <laughs> I love that. I love that. I think it's it's surprising. I wasn't. I didn't think friendship would show up, but it speaks so much to just. I think what I'm experiencing in my life at the moment. Okay, um, so let's, let's get into this then. The first question is this, what does friendship mean? And what does it look, feel and sound like? I think we all have these ideals of what friendship looks, feels and sounds like. And I think we, you know, there, there's always this temptation to sort of say, friendship is all about these undying bonds of loyalty and somebody you know has got your back regardless and you know and I think all of that's true but I th I feel like that changes over time um, and I feel like friendships the, the friendships that are the strongest are the ones that have experienced that deep connection that deep sense of you know you are my ride or die um, but then maybe have drifted apart for all sorts of reasons and then have come together again. And I find that it's that rebonding of friendship where I find the most joy in my friendships. So for me, I think friendship is something that isn't just about those bonds, but those bonds that have been strengthened by time and change and flux and all of those things that it's just part of the world around us. Yeah, and it, it's um, th this thing around friendship and time fascinates me so much because, like you've said, uh, it seems that when we have had a strong friendship in the past at some time, being apart or not being so close or even not being in contact doesn't seem to dilute the friendship when you reconnect and that doesn't make sense really it, you know why why is that do you think and I wonder whether a lot of that is about friendships that we build when we're much younger and I think friendship looks different for somebody who's a teenager or even sort of you know in your, your as a young adult um, in those in what's thought of as those formative years, I feel like those relationships somehow have a different, they have different ways of showing up. And I think it's those relationships where it's really easy to just dive straight back in and pick up where you left off. Yeah. Um, but what I found really interesting about those pick up where you left off old relationships and old friendships is that somehow you're present doesn't matter. And when I say matter, I mean, it doesn't change what that friendship looks like. And that's what I find really fascinating because you hear so much about people who reconnect, who are now in very, very different places in their lives. Yeah. And you wouldn't normally on paper ever imagine that they would have anything in common or anything to do with each other. And yet, because you have this history, this relationship that you had when you were much younger when things were different it's just so easy to pick up where you left off um and maybe it's i mean is part of that about just wanting to go back to a time where things seemed simpler and easier and it was just literally about you know going out to play whatever it was that you you did with as you were children you know whether it was exploring the neighborhood or climbing trees as I did uh, a lot of as a child or you know um, playing all sorts of sport that you made up where you you know mixed up all the rules of different games and you know created your own thing actually sorry that's just given me an idea I wonder whether creativity has something to do with it the the friendships that you build when you're younger and you're creating things together and you're sort of almost defining what the world feels like together what do you think about that? Does that? Yeah, I think that, that I think that touches some space where I think there's something about um, shared experiences generally 
that deepen the connection between people. And mm. like you say, you know, if, if you invent a new game with somebody, that's a, a really fantastic shared experience, which will give strength between the two of you. Um, but you're making me wonder, actually, about, you know, when you were talking about how people might have changed a lot and been in completely dif different circumstances, I'm just trying to think of whether I've reconnected with somebody who has then become a very close friend again, who I see a lot, or I think what is more, what I've experienced more is where you just meet up with somebody that you did know very well previously and you have a fantastic time, but it's not for very long. And so I, I just wonder there whether, like you were saying, you're kind of harking back to the past uh, and you, you're not allowing your differences that might be there now to come into play because you're not there long enough together to, for, for that to happen. But I could imagine people that have chosen very different routes um, if they were together for a, a longer period of time, finding that it didn't feel quite as comfortable for some reason. I, I don't know. Have you got any experience of that? I think that's really interesting. I think it's it's less my personal experience, but experiences that I see with family um, around, I mean, a very sort of close family where I see uh, my husband, for instance, who after years and years and years, almost 20 years, reconnected with school friends and his entire, you know, batch because they were celebrating a big anniversary of having finished school. Um, and then for many years after that, five, six years after that, there was this constant engagement and constant interaction and in and out of each other's homes and seeing each other all the time and, you know, traveling together and really sort of a relationship that felt very much like this is an old friendship reborn. And as soon as you have external forces that come into the conversation, and by external forces here, I'm talking politics and different sort of political opinions. It was, it's been fascinating to watch this thing play out because I think my husband went through a phase where he said, look, we have different political opinions, but that's fine because we have a shared history and that should trump our political opinion, our political differences. And yet that approach just wasn't sustainable because the differences were so vast that right. it just eventually you know it, you just dr drifted apart because you said it's 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 too strenuous to spend your time in in a relationship where there's such great difference yeah um so it, it's in, it's really interesting to see what changes friendships and what changes those relationships mm. Yeah. There's also something there about, um, I don't know whether it's levels of friendship or types of friendship. And you've reminded me, I had a call with um, somebody in America who is, uh, you know, that's their expertise is friendship. Mm -hmm. And I was astounded, actually, because she explained how she categorizes all of the people that she knows and calls friends. And she explained uh, that, you know, there's this person that I would go out for cocktails with, but mm. there's no way that I'd invite them round for dinner with some friends. Really? Wow. Yeah. So so she had gone to the, and consciously, you know, it was like really yeah. organized and detailed, um, this, this construction of the different types of friends that she's got and what she would and wouldn't do. And on the one hand, I, I kind of thought, well, uh, when I was thinking about it, I was thinking, well, yeah, there there are some people that I know that I would go out um, with um, for a night out, but yeah, I wouldn't want to spend too much time with it, you know, and so I was admitting it to myself, but then I don't think I could actually go about it in the way that she described yeah. it, which feels a bit too contrived. Um, yeah. So what do you think about that, this thing, this thing about different types and maybe levels of friendship? I don't know that I would call them friendship. 
that's that's I think the starting point for me. I I agree that there's different degrees of relationship that you have with you know different kinds of people, but for me, uh, as I, and I'm just literally thinking about this as I'm saying it to you. For me, if I consider somebody a friend, uh, my automatic starting point would be: Are there are they somebody that I would invite to my home um, just to be able to sit down? And you know, in in Bengal, in or in Bengali, I'm Bengali, and one of the sort of the concepts of that that friendships are built on is adda. Adda is chat. It's conversation, and it's very central to relationships. And it's it's literally that. It's would I do I think about somebody in that I would invite to my home to put their feet up and have an adda? Yeah, that for me is French is what friendship is based on. And when I'm thinking about the kind of people who I do that with on a regular mm -hmm. basis, there's a whole different range of people that you know that that come to mind and they're people that I've made friends with at work they're people I've known much longer than others uh, there are people with whom I have shared history and shared connection um, people I grew up with it's just there's a whole range of different people but there's clearly something that says I'm I'm able I am able to be comfortable enough with them to say, come to my space and be kind of, you know, be the most relaxed that you can be in having this conversation. And I think it's where all those guards come down that friendship really occurs. Everything else is in a different degree of acquaintanceship, I think. Okay. And so when, so you, so Arda, is that what you, you call it? Um, A -D -D -A, Arda. Yeah. Okay. So you're making me wonder about the difference between that and, for instance, when you meet somebody for the first time mm -hmm. and you have a really energetic, interesting conversation. Um, what's the difference between that and Adda? I mean, Adda is one of those things where it's just, it's almost stream of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And you will talk about literally everything from the micro to the macro from the personal to the political from the familial to the you know so it's just everything and these conversations usually sort of meander they um you know take all sorts of shapes and forms you might argue you might debate your you know with each other you might laugh you might you know there might be emotional moments um <laughs> one of my oldest friends somebody I've known since I was four years old. Um, when she comes to my home for lunch, I know that we're going to start, we'll eat lunch, we'll sit down to, you know, to start our adda. And at some stage, I know she's going to say to me, right, I've got to go and have a nap. So she will go into a bedroom, cover herself up and sleep for 15 minutes and then come back all charged up again. And that's what it takes. It's that you don't see that happening with somebody you meet in, you know, the first time. That yeah. might go into a relationship like that, but it's it's that degree of, you know, I am so totally comfortable in your home and in your space that I'm able to kind of just be. Yeah, and it, it, this is this is this is great because you're making me wonder. Just exploring this thing around um, strangers again. Because sometimes I find it easier to talk to strangers than I do to some people that I know, but probably aren't friends. Because mm -hmm. you're always kind of, well, what are they going to think if I say that? Mm -hmm. and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. So this is making me wonder whether strangers and friends are actually a lot closer together than we might have thought because if I think about some of the conversations and this no guard completely open completely trusting which is my starting point with a stranger I guess that's why is that the starting point is similar uh, one is an unknown and the other maybe can be trusted 
but the approach is very similar. So we'll, you, might, you might think of them at opposite ends of the scale. Perhaps it's more like in a circle because they're closer <laughs> together. I think that's fascinating. I hadn't actually ever thought about that, but you're right. I mean, I think we'll, you're, you tend to be so much less on guard with somebody who's a complete stranger because you're, you're, you're almost sort of exploring whether this stranger, which, and this perhaps goes back to the way your friend thinks about friendship is where does this person, where is this person going to end up in my network and in my spectrum of relationships? Um, and the starting point, perhaps, particularly if you have a really fantastic first meeting as strangers where you have amazing conversation, might be that you want to be able to see whether this goes into that sort of true friendship, trusted person zone. Yeah. And, you know, you're, you're making me think, uh, so this, this is a little bit of history for Values Jam, the card game, actually, because... Um, the origination of it was um, a World Values Day planning meeting. And at the meeting, lots of people were talking about how they would welcome the opportunity to have values-led conversations. And it was in the run-up to World Values Day a couple of years ago. And I just, it, it occurred to me that nobody really knew how to do this. And so I thought, a card game, that's that's what we should do. Now, you might not be aware of this. In America, there's a card game called We're Not Really Strangers. And so I thought that would be a brilliant partner. Uh, so we could partner with We're Not Really Strangers as part of World Values Day. And I looked up their website and I saw a video of basically two strangers coming together and having a conversation using these cards. And the one that I remember most strongly is um, one guy saying to another, what does your living room look like? That was the question. And they were sat at a table, for a small table facing each other. And the other guy just went like this. This is it. He was homeless. And then went on to describe, and it was a beautiful conversation. Mm. And it's it's a little bit bittersweet, actually, because I thought that that partnership idea was wonderful. So I reached out to the owners of uh, We're Not Really Strangers, explained, you know, I've got this idea, we can work together. Didn't get a response. Not oh. <laughs> and so I thought, well, in that case, we'll have to invent our own. <laughs> that was the beginning of Values Jam. Um, yeah, so strangers and friends. Okay. And what about, so we, we've we've kind of gone down this route and uh, I want to bring us back to the metaphor part of that question. So when you think of friendship, what images come to mind? What sounds come to mind? And what feelings come to mind? Uh, and I'm just going to respond with what's come to mind, top of mind, because yes. it's, I think it's it's contextual and it's got to do with just the time of year and what's happening in India right now. So we've just, it, it day before yesterday was um, a big festival in India. It was Dashera, um, again, where I am, it's Dashami, it's Bijaya Dashami. It's basically the end of nine days of celebration. Now this is a Hindu festival. It's not necessarily something that defines all of India, but it's something that is large, community-driven, particularly where I'm from, community-driven, et cetera. And it's, for me, the defining time for so much of my early friendships and my school friendships, because my family never celebrated this particular festival, but my closest friend's family did. And her whole family, her extended family, would get very deeply involved in putting this entire celebration together. And I would every year spend that five days, that week with her in her home, with her family. And for me, I think just because of the time of year and the fact that you've asked me this question, 
it's those things that are coming to mind. It is the memory of just, you know, there were three of us girls who would do this every time. So two of us would go and spend uh, that week with this one friend. And it would be the giggling and the getting ready to go out to, you know, to, to the celebration um, twice a day. You came back to get, you know, dressed up to go out. It was about all of the sights and sounds and smells of sort of religious ceremony, which regardless of whether you participated or not, that was just the overwhelming smell that you were left with. You know, it was the smell of that incense. It was the smell of the flowers. It was the chanting of, of, the, of the, um, the prayers. And this particular celebration, the sound of it, most of the, the, the most defining sound are these drums uh, that are very particular to this particular celebration. And it's just, it's something that evokes all kinds of things for me. And it literally, every time I smell that smell of incense and hear those drums, I go straight to this friend of mine. My brain goes directly to her. It's just, you know, it's, they, they're just inextricably linked. Um, she's also an amazing singer. She's the most, she has the most beautiful voice and an amazing singer. So, so much of that then goes from this, the sound of drums and the, you know, the, the sort of, incantation to her performing and playing the piano and you know just her voice and it, it, it's just so strange how your brain works isn't it I mean it, it takes you in all sorts of different directions and I'm sure if you asked me this question in August or I don't know April I'd have a completely different sort of answer for you because it would perhaps be triggered by whatever's happening around me then so yeah. that, that's interesting for me it's 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 what's, it, I wonder where the friendship, I don't know, sorry, my brain has just gone into a complete spiral in a different direction, but I was just wondering whether, particularly with friends that you're not in touch with regularly, why is it that there are moments when you think about them and you get in touch with them and they're like, I've been thinking about you too. And I wonder whether it's this, it's just these shared moments that you've forgotten about that kind of have triggered something subconsciously. Yeah, maybe. Maybe and it you you're talking there about the importance or the impact of context on a friendship, um, and it I think there's a connection there with what we were talking about earlier about shared experiences, you know, strengthening the, that that relationship. Um, and you're making me think about uh, a couple of friends actually. So one. Um, so th this is a, a bit of a sad story, actually, but um, I worked with this guy um, in hotels and we were good friends when we weren't working. And so spent a lot of time together. And I remember one evening uh, or night getting back from work and the light was on at the bottom of his door. So I just knocked on the door and he opened it. and. Uh, he had been crying and there was a kind of half drunk bottle of whiskey in the room. And he explained that his girlfriend had committed suicide. Um, so I stayed up with him all night. And um, then a little while later, I discovered that that wasn't true, uh, that he wasn't very well. Um, and uh, values jam does this actually. I haven't that hasn't crossed my mind for quite some time. Um, but I I remember having a real kind of battle with myself because one voice was saying, "How could he do that? You know, if you were friends, how could somebody do that?" And the other voice was saying, "He wouldn't do that on purpose. You know, he's not very well." Mm. And I don't think I've ever been able to rationalize the two, actually. Um, I remember feeling very hurt, um, but at the same, same time feeling really sorry that somebody should be in that sort of situation. Uh, so why am I sharing that? Um, 
I think it's something to do with how friendship is a lot to do with acceptance. And when you're friends with somebody, whatever happens kind of doesn't matter because you're still friends. Um, and also on the other side of acceptance, maybe there's this openness. So openness to realize that you've been upset and hurt, but that doesn't mean to say you, you still don't have feelings for your friend. So that was a bit of a, a rambling blurt there, but there's maybe something in it. But I think you've you've touched on a couple of things that are really that that bear sort of introspection. And I think so many of I mean, if you think about it, so many of us experience hurt in those friendships. And I just wonder whether that is about an expectation that's broken or so I'm not I'm not sure what that is about why why do we experience that hurt when somebody who's clearly unwell is going through something why is it about us yeah you know, you, know you you remember right at the beginning of this conversation you you talked about I can't remember the exact words but I, what I heard was something about the ideal of friendship and this kind of false picture you know this romantic picture of friendship so I wonder whether there's something to do about the difference between that and you know friendship in what is often a dirty life um, and us accepting that that can be part of it rather than having to be this rose-tinted version all the time yeah and it's it's it can be incredibly hard to truly suspend judgment. Um, but I wonder whether that's what makes for friendships that last, where you're actually able to suspend judgment entirely and remind yourself that this is not about you. It has nothing to do with you. It's something that they're going through and it's what can you do to be a friend? And maybe that's what creates transformative friendships. Um, I've just in intellectualized this whole thing completely, but it's it's much it's in my head and in my heart. It's much more of an emotional thing than it is an intellectual thing. It is, I think, the ability to really kind of empathize with somebody else and put them first. Um, yeah, yeah. It's just a hard thing to do sometimes, but yeah, and you you talk that. You talk there about intellectualizing. So let's um, throw ourselves into a much more practical space. So um, when have you noticed a lack of friendship? Oh, this is a hard question. Um, everything that's coming to mind is, I mean, I, for some reason, I assume that that question, the answer to that question is a big moment. And everything that's coming like, to mind is not. Whatever's yeah. there. Whatever's there. I mean, it's been things like where, uh, and again, I'm going back to when I was much younger. And feeling like I wasn't being included in something that was deeply, deeply hurtful with, you know, sort of feeling excluded, left out of a relationship that I thought was a deep friendship um, and that, you know, would include me in every way. But the moment there is even the slight exclusion that's felt extremely hurtful. Um, I think where... Uh, there was another thing that came to mind and a, a, a more recent thing about a lack of friendship. Um, I think it's just, you know, when you see, again, this is something that's happened more recently, but deep friendships, regular sort of, you know, 
seeing each other all the time, traveling together, holidaying together, lots of shared interests. And then something shifts and you don't quite know what it is, but then the other person just sort of extracts themselves from that relationship. And it's, it leaves me feeling incredibly confused and like, did I, what, did I do something? What happened there? What, you know, wh why is this happening? Um, and it's taken a lot for me to sort of say, maybe I did something and it, I do need to introspect and see if I did anything and, you know, that I recognize, but also maybe it's just that this person's going through something else. Yeah. And am I able to suspend judgment? And I have to say it's hard. <laughs> I'm struggling with that right now. But yeah, it's just that this person's going through something that means that they have withdrawn friendship. Mm. And mine, mine's kind of the other side of the coin because it's more, it's more about um, me making the choices rather than in your example where somebody else has made the choices. So I remember running a, a business, so a, a hotel business, and I don't, again, you've done this to me. I, I don't know why I remember this, but I remember one of the guys from my team saying, a few of us are going to the pub after we finish today. Would you like to come? And I said, that's great. Thank you so much. But um, no, I've got other plans. The truth was, I at that time believed that there was a very fine line between being able to lead people uh, where you were too close to them personally. And whether I wasn't able to manage the two together or, or whether it was the, the, the right thing to do, I made the choice to err on the side of being professional and not allowing the risk of more personal or friendship mm -hmm. to, to get in the way of that. Um, so interesting, isn't it, that we got those two, two different examples, one where you were kind of on the receiving end of somebody's choice and then my example of where I, I made that choice. And I, just thinking about what you, your your reaction, I haven't really thought about this, but that might well have been the reaction of those people. You know, it's like, well, does Alan think he's so good that he can't come out with us, you know, and be our friends? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. mm. So it's such a human thing, right? It's all about, it's about acceptance and it's about a, a feeling of, you know, do they think they're too good for me? And, you know, do they think I'm not good enough for them? There's all that sort of very human, um, you know, uh, interpersonal self-esteem. It's just so much wrapped up in it. So the, you think about friendship as something that's really simple and and easy. And it's it, it's probably one of the deepest, most complex experiences in your life, right? Yeah, I think you're right. And uh, just thinking a bit more about the the example that I gave, we that business was very successful and uh, we had a very successful team, uh, brilliant professional relationships, um, but it never really, and I'm very fond of those people and still in touch with some of them now, but I wouldn't actually describe them as friends. They were just fantastic colleagues. Um and that's fine, actually. Uh, I think, you know, why not? Why not celebrate that? Why? Because and maybe there's something about um, is friendship, in some cases, overestimated. You know, do you do you need to be friends with somebody to have a brilliant, productive, positive relationship? Um, I I don't think you do. Mm. There are lots of different ways of having brilliant, productive, creative relationships that really inspire the best um, in each other. And I think, I think sort of professional relationships are exactly a description of those because I feel like that's, I mean, I can think of so many of those relationships where those are not necessarily friendships. Um, you do have a there is a very deep interpersonal relationship, yeah. but um, 
it's designed to do something else. It's, you know, um, I, I think it's, it's a good question. I mean, do you need to be friends in order to be deeply productive? It's one of the biggest management challenges that every single person manager will ever tell you that they struggle with, right? Is trying to get their teams to understand that you don't have to be friends in order to be productive. Yeah. yeah. And I, I remember my son, my son or uh, eldest son also went into hospitality. And I remember him saying that he realized that he had gone too far on, you know, wanting people to like him in order that he would be able to do a better job. But then realizing that then he had stepped over that line and he had become a friend and so couldn't have the authority that he had previously enjoyed because of that. So it's a, a fine line. And you, the, you're talking about the professional relationship having a purpose, I think, is um, really helpful because it brings people together or can in, in a positive way. And I wonder if that's one of the differences um, with friendship in that friendship is without purpose, actually. Yeah. Yeah, completely. And it's, it's just, just for what it is. Yeah. The moment there's purpose, somehow it feels like transaction follows. Yeah. And transaction, a relationship that, that is transactional is always, is somehow in my head is always going to prioritize the transaction over the interpersonal, right? So, yeah. Yeah. So maybe that's that's you know when we earlier when we were talking about friendship we didn't actually touch on this but it's um, it is a more pure personal relationship than perhaps any other I wonder because even if you you, you talked about your husband earlier um, when you're talking about um, partnerships in that sense they're still there still feels like there might be a more transactional element in those relationships than in a true friendship. Mm -hmm. You haven't got the burden of the responsibility and all of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and the, I remember reading an article actually that was talking about how we don't truly understand and appreciate the importance of friendship in that sometimes we only allow time for friends when we have time available and what it was saying was that actually friendship is the most important relationship you can have with anybody and so you don't you should not leave it to chance you know you should protect that space um so what, what are your thoughts there and in particular I'm, I'm curious about this difference between uh, a personal relationship where you're like a partner or a marriage or whatever versus friendship. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I think even the best sort of uh, partnership relationships as in a marriage or a, a sort of a, a romantic partnership, um, you're absolutely right that I think even if they're built on friendship and the best of them are, there, there is an, a, a layer of transaction just because of life. And, you know, the, living means that there's going to be that transactional sort of relationship that is layered in. Um, sorry, I've gone down. <laughs> Remind me what your question was. Because was I'm so you, you, you started down that route. So we, we were exploring the difference between a romantic um, relationship or a marriage compared to friendship. And you were saying that, you know, in life, when you have a partner or you're married, you have to navigate the the transactions of life, right? So what are we going to eat and who's how are we going to pay the bills and all that sort of stuff? Whereas friendship, seems to have less of that uh, so it's a very um it's a very privileged environment friendship from what we've discussed and it's it just I mean the thing that's going on in my head and it feels like it's a different thing and yet 
it's not is a conversation we were having you know we we host these generosity discovery events once every six weeks and it's really just an opportunity for anybody who wants to talk about generosity to join us and have a conversation and we invite two people to talk briefly about the topic that we're we're focused on and the last one we did was on mindfulness uh, and the links between mindfulness and generosity and one of the speakers who is you know an incredibly accomplished professional an hr professional is now sort of a the co-founder of a startup that is helping social entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs to scale their businesses and all of that and she's on her own mindfulness journey and she was talking about her own experience where as this as a professional as a successful professional she prioritized that over everything else in her life over the friendships in her life and over the you know the the her partnership her family everything else and you know the, she, she kept looking at the next promotion and the next increment and the next you know those were the markers of success and it was only when she kind of flipped the script um and for her flipping that script and the access to mindfulness was in starting to prioritize those friendships Mm-hmm. And it was in that, in in that sort of, um, in those non, just all the stuff that we've talked about, those non-transactional, without a purpose relationship that is built truly just on two human beings relating to each other on all sorts of different levels, um, that she dis- she rediscovered what mindfulness meant, and she re- rediscovered, you know. Um, that that was her way of accessing mindfulness. And it's just, it's such a reminder that we even when we don't see it, our lives are so transactional. And it's really helpful to sort of think about what's going to help us step away from that for a minute and just be. Yeah. And friendships seem to be the access to that. And it's, you know, that's where, maybe that's the purpose. <laughs> it's... <laughs> Um, it, it is just, you know, access to something that isn't transactional, isn't sort of quantifiable. It isn't one of those things that is. It's it's about just helping you be yourself. Yeah, I, I love that. And so, so what you're saying is that friendship is the access to being yourself. Um, yeah. I, th- I think that is a brilliant way to start to bring this values jam to a close. I don't think we can get better than than that. So thank you. And there is a final question, um, which is this. Um, what are you encouraged to do differently about friendship as a result of this conversation? I mean, I've had this mental ticker going all this while about I've got to call this person and that person and that person and that person. <laughs> it's just been sort of like, <laughs> you know, stop taking your friends for granted. You've got to be more intentional about the intentional about this. You've got to go out and call them. And I know that when all of them listen to this, they're all going to be laughing when they hear me say this bit because I am notorious for being terrible at keeping in touch and it's awful. I really got to do something to change that. So that's that's what this conversation has kind of reminded me. Um, okay. So Priyanka, I'm gonna I'm gonna push you a little bit on this. So if you could take that intention that you've just described and now turn it into a more concrete, practical action, and it could be uh, I'm gonna call such and such a person, or it could be I'm gonna make a list of. 10 people and I'm going to connect with them over the next month or whatever it is. What what does that look like? Sorry, I, maybe I didn't communicate that very clearly. It's absolutely, there's a list in my head of people that I want to call yeah. in the next few days to say, yeah. how are you doing? What's been happening? I'm sorry, I've been honestly so rubbish at keeping in touch. Um, and, you know, just what's happening? and when can we when can we do our equivalent of the adda even if we're not in the same physical location because you know friends are that's the thing with friends as well right is that you're all over the all over the world yeah um, 
Yeah. So that that there's a very specific list of people in my head that I want to call and reconnect and mine, with. Mine is similar, but I'm you're making me feel a bit guilty now because I've just got one person. <laughs> so uh, this is um, somebody who lived across the street for me when I was uh, growing up and uh, that he's in Australia now. And the last time we saw each other was probably around about three years ago. So we see each other occasionally, but we're not really in touch very much in between times. Uh, so this conversation has prompted me just to say hi to him, whether it be on WhatsApp or, or whatever it is. So I'm feeling really good about that. So thank <laughs> you. And you're now a qualified values jammer. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much, Alan. This is such a wonderful conversation. It really, it just, it's felt incredibly um, joyful in some ways, I feel. It's, it's just, it's just a reminder of humanity and you know the fact that we all we're more than our jobs and we're more than the next meeting absolutely it, it, it's been such a wonderful reminder of that thank you so much thank for you inviting me. bye now bye